tell you what, um, the years that I've been preaching, I've never had a pastor tell me to take as long as I want to preach. <laughs> and your pastor told me that. He gave me that permission. Um, thank you all so much, um, well, well Community Church. And um, Pastor Shad, a brother of mine, I thank God for you and the relationship that God is forming in our city along with your pastor, Al. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this blessed privilege to gather together um, as saints. Lord God, to worship you together in one accord, um, songs of worship, songs of adoration to you. Thank you for the worship. Um, and Lord, now that as we get ready to open up your word, the truth of your word, that you by your spirit will speak to our hearts um, to hear exactly what you want us to hear, Father God, so that our lives will become more like Jesus. Lord, have your way with me by way of your spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I just want to look at um, the Gospel of John, the Gospel of John, chapter 17, and um, just going to move around in that particular passage as the Lord has given it to me. But I want to speak from the subject of the importance of unity, the importance of unity from the Gospel of John, chapter 17, and we'll just look at different verses um, that the Lord has kind of put in my heart to share um, for this evening. But when you really think about it, um, 2020 issued quite a bit of challenges. We, we, we know that without a doubt. We dealt with COVID. We dealt with George Floyd. We dealt with the elections. Um, we dealt with a lot in 2020 um, that, that really caused much division, much division. And not, not so much from the world, but the church, but the church. And, you know, as we look at 2020 and we look at all of the things that we have to experience and endure, what I really believe in my heart is that, that and, it's, and it's biblical because the Bible tells us that, that the love of many will grow cold, um, that lawlessness will abound or lawlessness will increase. And if you're paying attention, these things are actually playing themselves out right now. Lawlessness is increasing. The love of many is growing cold. And we realize also that there will be a seven-year rule by the Antichrist. Satan, Satan will rule for seven years. For seven years. And as we approach these days, these times, the church of the living God, I believe with everything in me, the church of the living God will begin to emerge um, because the, Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail against his church. I believe that the church of the living God will emerge in the midst of all of the chaos. As a matter of fact, the darker it gets, the brighter our lights will shine to the glory of God. But as these things increase, it, it, it's burning in my spirit, it's burning in my heart that we as followers of Jesus Christ, the church, the called out ecclesia, the called out of God, need to be unified. We have to operate in unity. We have to operate. It's, it, it's not an option for us to not operate in unity. And, and God is calling his church. He's calling his church. I do believe that the times um, are, are, are challenging, challenging. We're starting to find out now who's who, who's who. Um, and, and you don't know gold is gold until you put it in fire. And I believe that the heat is being turned up in the times in which we live, the, the fire, the heat is being turned up, turned up on those who say they are the church. Because everyone who says they're church may not be part of the church. And the times will reveal that. Times will reveal that. Times are revealing that. Some, some people that I, I held near and dear to my heart during last year, during last year, um, now I, I'm questioning whether or not they are truly of the faith. Truly of the faith, because if you are of the faith and if you have made a decision to follow Jesus Christ, these things will not divide the church. And Jesus, in this particular passage, Jesus is on his way back to the Father. And he's praying. He's praying for his followers. He prayed for the disciples, and he also included us in his prayer, in his prayer. And, and unity is important. It is so important. And Evangelist James Robinson, I love this, James Robinson, he says, I know when Jesus is coming back. He says, I know when Jesus is coming back. He says, he's coming back when the bride is ready for his return. When the bride is dressed. You know, you can't start a wedding until the bride is dressed. You can have all the groomsmen in place. You can have the preacher in place. You can have everything in place. But if that bride is not ready, that wedding cannot start. 
I've been in many, I've done many weddings and it's supposed to start at a certain time, but the bride's not ready. And we can't get started until that bride is ready. But once the bride is ready, now we can have the wedding. And, and he says, he says that I believe Jesus is coming when he looks over and he says, now my bride is ready. Why? Because they are now one. They are now one. And the times require us to stick together in unity. That, that, that's the worst thing you can have is to be in combat. I'm a former military guy, served in the United States Army, Desert Storm, Desert Shield. The worst thing you can have is to have a, a, a unit fall apart in times of crises. That's the, that is the most important time. That is the critical time to where we ought to unify. It, as a matter of fact, I began to think about the movie Gladiator. Anyone seen the movie Gladiator with Russell Crowe? Anyone seen that movie? Well, there's a scene in that movie. I love this scene. I love this scene. And in this, in, this, in, this, in this scene, they're actually in the arena. They're in the Coliseum in the arena. And they're outnumbered. They don't have the weapons that the enemy has. And they are being attacked. And, and they're all scattered. They're all scattered. And then Russell Crowe says something that's so profound. He says, come together. He says that, right? And all of a sudden, they, 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 they join. They lock arms. They get close. They get back to back with each other. And they get real tight together. And you know what happens? They overcome the enemy. But if they, were, if they were individual and operating separate from each other, there's no way they could have overcome the obstacle uh, or, or the attack that they, were being, um, that they were under at that particular time. And you know what God is saying to the church? Come together. He's calling us to come together. We have to be unified in the times in which we live. We can't be divided. And unity is critically important. It's critically important. And so there's three things that I want to talk about as it relates to the importance of unity. And again, if you don't have a Bible, um, if you don't have a Bible and you need a Bible, just raise your hand. I may have missed it already, but if you need a Bible, everyone need a Bible, just raise your hands. There we go. If you need one, just raise your hands and they will equip you with a Bible and it's for yours to keep. What a blessing. Anyone, just raise your hands and they'll bring that to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. John chapter 17, John chapter 17, the importance of unity from John chapter 17. So it's three things that I just want to talk about, and we'll jump through the passage as the Lord has given it. Unity is important, and because it's important, Jesus prayed for unity. And if Jesus prayed for unity, then you and I ought to pursue it. We should pursue unity since Christ prayed for unity. Since Christ prayed for it, you and I should pursue it. We must pursue it if Jesus prayed for it. In verse 9, he says, my prayer is not for the world. And again, Jesus is on his way back to the Father, and he's praying. He's praying for his followers. He says, my prayer is not for the world, but for those you have given me because they belong to you. All who are mine belong to you, and you have given them to me, so they bring me glory. Now I am departing from the world. They are staying in this world but I am coming to you. Holy Father, you have given me your name. Now protect them by the power of your name. Look, so that they will be united just as we are. So that they will be united just as we are. And look at verse 21. Verse 21, he says, I pray that they will all be one just as you and I are one as you are in me, Father, and I am in you. Verse 22, I have given them the glory you gave me so they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity. Christ prayed that we would be one. And if he prayed it, we must pursue it. We must pursue it. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians 4, 3 through 6, he says, look, make every effort, do everything you can to keep yourselves united in spirit, united in spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body and one spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father who is over all and in all and living through all. He says, make every effort. Make every effort. Every effort. 
I am committed to unity in the church. I refuse to allow anything to cause division with my brothers and sisters in Christ. Nothing, nothing. And you and I have to have that mindset. We cannot allow anything to cause division in the church. And again, there are so many things that, that, that the world will throw at us, that will throw at us, that causes division. Again, last year, last year, I'm telling you, COVID-19 challenged the church. Um, I'm speaking with Shad and, 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 and um, Zach earlier. It's amazing. I don't, I, sometimes I don't even know who's who anymore. We have people who have not shown back up post-COVID, and I don't know where they're at. I don't even know where they stand. I don't even know where they stand. And then, of course, the whole George Floyd thing just began to reveal true colors of who people really are, who they are, and, and the BLM movement and all these things that people began to attach themselves to that caused division. And then we had the election. We had the election. And you've got Republican and you've got Democrat. And those things cause division. Can I be honest with you? I just need to be really, really honest with you. The scripture is so clear. It says a house divided cannot stand. A house, Jesus said this, a house divided cannot stand, cannot stand. And we have a divided nation. America is a divided nation. It is a divided nation. And it's inevitable. It's not if we fail. It's a matter of when now. It's just a matter of when. But the church of the living God will stand together in unity. All else around us can crumble, but we will not be divided. He says, make every effort is what Paul says. And Christ says, I pray that they will be one as we are, Father. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one God, one triune God. And he's praying that the church would be one. Colossians 3, 14, 15 says, above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony, and let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts, for as members of one body, you are called to live in peace. Called to live in peace. First Peter 4, 8. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sin. That's how we maintain unity is our love for each other. We love each other unconditionally. Unconditional love for each other. There is nothing that you can do that will cause me to stop loving you or to separate myself from you. That's not real love. Real love, real love goes to a cross. Real love hung on that cross. And it wasn't the nails that kept Jesus there, by the way. It was not the nails. It was his love for you and I and his desire to make us one with him and the Father. And he, Christ prayed that we would be one. He prayed that you and I would be one. Therefore, we need to pursue it. We're not going to let anything divide us. The world can, but not the church. Not the church. There will be no divisions. No, no, not the church of the living God. No, no, you're my brother. You're my sister. And, and it goes beyond anything. There's nothing greater than the church of the living God. Do you not know we are the most powerful entity on planet Earth? When we come together in unity as one, as one. And the times, the times will manifest whether or not you are the church. You are the church. So, so Christ prayed for it. Therefore, we need to pursue it. We need to pursue it. The second thing, we must preserve and protect our peculiarity. Somebody say that word. Say peculiarity. <laughs> it's one of those ones. It's one of those words you got to work on a little bit. But we must preserve and protect our peculiarity. Now, now what do you mean by that? Now, look. Again, verse 9, Jesus says this. He says, look, my prayer is not for the world, but for those you have given me because they belong to you, right? That's the church. We are the church. We, we belong to Christ. We have been separated from the world, and we belong to Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? Amen. Listen, okay, let me, let me just go ahead and say this now. I am a gospel preacher. I love to hear feedback. I love for you to say amen. It's okay to say amen. All right? I'll preach hard if y'all say amen. But, but he says, look, you have given, though for those you have given me, because they belong to you, all who are mine 
belong to you, and you have given them to me, so they bring me glory. They bring me glory. Now watch what he says. He says, now I am departing from the world, verse 11. They are staying in this world, but I'm coming to you, Holy Father. Christ is going back to the Father. You have given me your name. Now protect them by the power of your name so that they will be united just as we are during my time here. I protected them by the power of the name you gave me. We're talking about preserving and protecting our peculiarity. Now, what do you mean by that? Now, Christ says, Christ says, the name, Father, that you gave me. Well, what does Jesus mean by that name? What does he mean by the name, the name, the name? Well, in John chapter 8, in John chapter 8, Jesus has a conversation with religious leaders, um, and, and, it, and the conversation kind of ended on this note. Jesus says, before Abraham was born, I am. He says, before Abraham was born, I am. Am. Now, you just can't make that kind of statement as a Jewish man during this particular time. You can't make that kind of statement. As a matter of fact, the scripture says they took up stones to kill him. They took up stones to kill him. And for anyone that ever tries to deny Jesus Christ, that is a great passage of scripture that you could use to just help them understand that Jesus Christ indeed was God in the flesh because Jesus himself said, I am. Before Abraham was born, I am. And the scripture says they took up stones to kill him. And so anyone who tries to deny the deity of Jesus Christ, you can go right to this verse and just tell them to answer the one question. Tell them to just answer the one question. Why were they trying to kill him then? Why did they take up stones? Why did they take up stones? Because Jesus himself was declaring himself to be God. You can't just say I am. You can't make that statement. And what that statement did, it takes us all the way back to Exodus chapter 3 to the burning bush experience. And you had Moses at the burning bush. And God says, Moses, I need you to go down and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Let my people go. And Moses says, okay, God, I'll do that. I'll do that. But if they ask me, when they ask me, what is your God's name, what am I to tell them? And God told Moses, tell them, I am that I am. The name. The name. Now, now watch the peculiarity. He says, I, you, you've given me your name, now protect them by the power of your name. And when I'm, when, I'm, when I'm talking about preserving and protecting our peculiarity is that now we operate in, under the power of the I am, of the I am. That's peculiar, that, and we need to preserve that. And what, now, now, what do you mean by that, Stuart? What do you mean by that? See, we live in an age, we live in a time where people are giving up their name and who we are in Christ and our peculiarity in Christ, and we're giving that up and embracing worldly names. Democrat, Republican, black, white, Baptist, Methodist, Pentecostal, Kojic. We're embracing all of these other names, and there's only one name. And Jesus, he says, I pray that you keep them in that name, in that name. And see, that name has authority. That's where the authority comes from, the name. It comes from the name. Um, Peter says it like this, you are a chosen race, peculiar people, right? This is, this is who we are. This is, this is our identity is in the name and nothing else. I'm not attaching myself to any other name. I refuse to attach myself to any... I am a Christian, and that's it. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. And you know, when he comes back, he's not coming back for Pentecostals. He's not coming back for a church of God and Christ and Presbyterians. He's not coming back. He's coming back for his church. He is coming back for his church. And, and what happens, see, what happens when we forfeit the name the, and operate under the I am and, and I'm telling you all, that is so powerful to know that Jesus has asked God to protect them by the power of the name, of the name. And then we embrace some other name, then we subject ourselves with everything that goes with it. And people talk about privilege. That's a word that came up a lot last year, a word that still comes up on a regular basis. 
right? You, you hear yeah, there's white privilege or there's, there's black privilege or whatever kind of privilege you want to call it. But can I be honest with you? If you have the name, you have kingdom privilege. Somebody ought to say amen right there. You have kingdom privilege. So, so I could care less. I could care less about whatever systems that you say are in place. I, I don't care. Do you not know there have always been systemic issues? There was, there was systemic issues when God's children were in Egypt. There was a system problem. There was a, a systemic problem. God doesn't care about systems. He is the I am. And when we begin to operate under the name of the I am, God breaks chains. God sets his people free. And I am not subject, uh, subjecting myself to a worldly name when I operate under the name of the I am. And that gives me authority and that gives me power. Amen. Amen. No, 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 no. No, I'm not giving that up. Not giving that up because of the name. He says, I, and I pray. And he says, I've kept them by the name that you gave me the name that you gave me. And see, when you have that kind of attitude, when one has that kind of attitude and when one understands who they are and whose they are, now we begin to live. Now we begin to operate in the authority that God already ordained for us to have, that he already ordained for us to have. I'm so excited to be a child of God. Do you not know children of the most high God who operate in the authority of God? We have the authority of God and we can walk into any situation and things have to change. They have to change because of who we are. But if I forfeit that name, if I give that up, then I, I subject myself to everything that goes with whatever else that is. And there's no authority. But as long as I maintain the name, everything that God has for me, I will get because that's what God wants me to have. And there's no one or nothing that can hinder that or stop that because of the name. And we must preserve that. We must preserve our peculiarity. But then look what he says. He goes on, he says in verse 13. Now, um, it was verse 12, he says, During my time here, I protected them by the power of the name you gave me. I guarded them so that not one was lost except the one headed for destruction. As the scriptures foretold, we know that was Judas. He says, Now I'm coming to you. I told them many things while I was with them in this world. Watch this. So they will be filled with my joy. Filled with my joy. And where does this joy come? This joy comes from our salvation experience. This comes from our salvation experience. The fact that God has given us salvation. He, he saved you and I. Therefore, we have joy. And it doesn't matter what happens on this. It really doesn't matter. The joy that we have, God has given us that by way of salvation. And you ought to, anytime somebody start talking about salvation, the saint ought to get excited. Anytime we begin talking about, anytime you hear that word salvation, you ought to be excited. You ought to be super excited. Anytime you hear the word salvation, why? God saved us. God delivered us. And it was by grace. It was nothing on our own. God did that for us. And he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. You ought to always be excited about your salvation. And he says, look, look, that they will be filled with my joy, with my joy. I have given them your word. Look, and the world hates them because they do not belong to the world. Again, peculiarity. We don't belong in this world. When the world, when we begin to look like the world, now we forfeited and we're giving up our peculiarity. We're giving up. We're giving up ground. And, and we start to look like the world. The world should hate us. We don't belong here. They do not belong to the world is what he says. Just as I do not belong to the world. Verse 15. Now he says, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. Now, Christ left, he, he, he's saying he's leaving, the, he le left the 11 there. He's going back to the Father, left them here, left them here in the world, and he's saying protect them from the evil one. Now, you and I need to understand something. 1 John 5 says that the whole world lies under the power of the evil one. The whole world. The whole world. And when we begin to look at, again, the systems of the world and all of these different things that, that, that people in high places and, and positions and positions of power and all of these things, Satan controls this. And we're moving towards his rule. He is going to rule seven years. 
And I, I believe this with everything in me. See, we get caught up in, in politics and all of these things. Let me tell you something. If Jesus wanted to overthrow the government, he would have done so when he came. He would have done so. Jesus, all he had to do was speak the word, and it would have been over with. But he didn't come for that. Now, the next time he comes, he's going to establish his rule. There will be a thousand-year millennial reign. Satan's going to rule for seven years, and then Christ will set up shop, and he is going to rule the world, one government under the banner of Jesus Christ. So he didn't come to do that the first time. And we spent so much time, we spent so much time talking about the government and all of these different things. And listen, these things have to exist. They, they're going to be here until Christ comes, until Christ comes. But when Christ comes, things will change. But the whole world lies under the power of the evil one. And he says, I'm not taking you out of the world. He didn't, he didn't, not now, not now. And so we need, we're still here. We're in the world, but not of the world. In the world, but not of the world. And he says, make them holy. Make them holy by your truth. Holy means set apart. We're sanctified. We're set apart. We're called out. Come from among them and be separate. We do not belong to this world. Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. The Bible is the word of God. It is truth. Now, again, society and the times in which we live, people are coming up with their own truth. They're coming up with their own. They'll, they'll, they'll just come up with their own truth, their own truth apart from the, And if it's, if it's not the word of God, we know that it is not the truth. And he says, just as you sent me into the world, I am sending them into the world. And I give myself as a holy sacrifice for them so they can be made holy by your truth. Now, Christ gave himself up. He died. For you and I to be set apart. We're talking about peculiarity. Jesus Christ sacrificed his life in order for you and I to be set apart and not like this world. So why would we go and subject ourselves again to the world when Christ has sacrificed his life to set us free? To set us free. Why? Why? He says, I've given myself a holy sacrifice for them so they can be made holy, set apart by your truth. I am praying all. Oh, this is, this is the part I love because I get happy right here because now he's talking about us, you all. He says, I am praying, verse 20, not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. Guess what? That's us. That's us. 2,000 years ago, Christ is praying for us. You know, he told Thomas, latter part of John's gospel, latter part of John's gospel, he said, Thomas, Thomas says, I'm not going to believe unless I see the nail prints in his hands, right? I'm not going to believe. And, and Jesus revealed himself to Thomas, and Thomas, my Lord and my God. And Jesus says, well, Thomas, because you've seen, you believe, but blessed are they who have never seen and yet believe. He's talking about you and I, just like right here. I'm praying not only for these, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. And then look, verse 22, he says, I have given them the glory you gave me the glory you gave me. Now, that verse messed me up, Shaq. That verse messed me up. Because in Isaiah 42, 8, the scripture says, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another. This is what the word of God says in Isaiah 42, 8. But here, he says, I've given them the glory that you gave me. You know what? That takes us right back to the renown. That, that, that's the renown of God, the name of God, the glory of God. We bear the image of Almighty God. He's given us that. God has given us. That is peculiar. That is different. And God has given us that. I've got a couple of scriptures. Look, Hebrews 2.11 says this. So now, Jesus... And the ones he makes holy have the same father. That is why Jesus is not ashamed to call them his brothers and sisters. Galatians 3.28, there is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Colossians 3.10.11, put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him in this new life. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew 
or a Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free. Christ is all that matters, and he lives in all of us. Revelation 5, 9, and 10. I love this. Revelation 5, 9, and 10, it says, And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy art thou to take the book and to break its seals, for thou wast slain and didst purchase for God with thy blood men from, oh, men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and thou hast made them to be a kingdom and priest to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Don't miss the word from. He says, I've called them from every nation, every nation, every tribe, tongue, and people. He called them from. And see, many times we are still trying to hold on to our ethnicity, to our background, and and, and whatever else we're trying to hold on to. God has called us from that. And now he's made us, us, a kingdom of priests, a holy nation, a peculiar nation is who we are. We're set apart. We're special. We're special. You ought to look at somebody and say, you're special. Look at somebody and say, you're special. He called us from. That's our peculiarity. And we need to preserve that. And we need to protect that. And anything that seeks to come between that, we've got to tear it down in the name of Jesus. We have to tear it down because we, we're trying to preserve unity. And it's important. It's important. And the moment, the moment we take on these other names, it, it, it takes away our identity and our peculiarity. Now we look like everyone else because we are embracing what everyone else embraces. And young people, ooh, especially young people, be extremely careful with who you link yourselves up with, who you join yourselves to. Because, again, the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus says, I've come that you may have life and that you may have it to the full, to the full. And no denomination, no, 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 no party, no um, political party, whatever you want to name, none of those things should cause division because we are preserving and protecting our peculiarity. Last point. Last point. We need to place high priority on the purpose of unity. We need to place a high priority on the purpose of unity. What's the purpose? What's the purpose? Look right there in verse 21. Jesus says, I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. It's the purpose that the world will believe you sent me. Verse 22, I have given them the glory you gave me so they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity, here it is again, that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. What's the purpose? So that the world will know that Jesus came. That's why it's important that we maintain unity, that the world will know that Jesus came. You know, know, someone's salvation, someone's salvation hinges on our unity. When they see us operate together as one, they can actually be saved. Never thought about it like that. Think about that. That's why it's important that we're one. And see, here's the deal. There are people that I believe really, really want to embrace Jesus. They're just trying to figure out which one or or which political party is he, which denomination is he. They're trying to figure it out. Is Jesus a Democrat? Is he a Republican? Is he Kojic? Is he Pentecostal? Is he Baptist? Which one is he? And they're trying to figure it out. They're trying to figure it out. That's why it's important for us to be one so that they understand who he is. He's not coming back for the Baptists. He's coming back for the church. He's not coming back for the Pentecostal. He's coming back for the church, for the church. And and we need to place high priority on the purpose. That's why we must maintain unity. We're one. 
We are one so they get a glimpse of who he is. They need to see Jesus from his church. But if we're divided, if we're fighting each other and, and one, one church elevates itself over another church or whatever you want to call it, one race elevates itself over another race, um, one, one political party elevates itself over another political party, but then we're carrying the name Jesus, now that becomes confusing. And there's confusion, and God is not the author of confusion. And so we, the people of God, we must place a high priority on unity because somebody needs to be saved. Someone needs to know that Jesus Christ came in the flesh, and they'll see it. They'll see it when they see us as one. When they begin to see the church operate together in unity, oh, you can look out. You may as well get ready for a revival to break loose when the church comes together as one. Um, um, the psalmist says, Psalm, Psalm says that, that unity commands a blessing. Unity commands a blessing. God has to bless when there's unity. And when the church comes together, look out, look out. And you know what? I believe, I believe everything in me, Shad. God is linking us together. Al, he's linking the church together. He's bringing his people together. He's pulling his bride together, especially in these latter days. And I'm super excited about that. And when those things begin to take place, when you begin to see unity in the body of Christ here in San Antonio, I'm praying, I am praying, I am praying for a joint worship service in the Alamo Dome for all the saints of God in San Antonio. That's my prayer. Help me in that endeavor. Pray with me. Pray with me. There's some things that are happening right now. There are some things that are happening right now. God is moving in the hearts of his people, and he's bringing us together in these last days. Why? So that people can see Jesus. We're the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. There's, there's no broken up body. There's no broken up body. There's one body. There's one church. And as we come together, people will begin to get saved. John 13, 35 says, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Love for one another. And see, it doesn't take long, and it shouldn't take long for us to begin to display the love of Jesus Christ amongst each other. We ought to be able to sit down and have a meal together. We ought to be able to sit down and fellowship together. And you know what? If you name the name of Jesus Christ, you're my brother. If you name the name of Jesus Christ and you believe Jesus Christ is your personal Savior, you're my sister. And, and, and we're not going backwards. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We're not going backwards. We're going forward. I need y'all to hear my heart on this. We are not going backwards. There are a lot of things that happened in the past. A lot of things that happened in the past. But you know what? Shad, you didn't do that to me. You've been my brother ever since I met you. And you've done nothing but love me. And you've embraced me as a brother. And I'm not going to hold anybody hostage for something in the past. And that's wrong. And when people begin to make, to, to make apologies and say all these things, Al, you've never done anything wrong to me. You've done nothing but love me from the time we met and we broke bread together and we fellowship with each other and we love each other. And that's enough. And we go forward, not looking backwards. We're not looking. I'm not looking back. I'm not looking back. That's the past. But we have to look ahead because Jesus is coming back and he's coming back for his church coming back for his church by this will all men know that you're my disciples when you have love one for another first john 4 11, 12 says dear friends since god loved us that much we surely ought to love each other no one has ever seen god but if we love each other god lives in us and his love is brought to full expression in us they'll see him They'll see Jesus when we're one. They'll see Jesus when we operate in unity, when we operate as one. They'll get a chance to see Jesus and say, I want that Jesus. I want to know him. There's something special about you all. There's something peculiar about you all. And it's Jesus Christ. He says, I've given them your glory. I've given them your glory. We have the glory of Christ resting on us. The name above all names. And we're peculiar. We've been set apart. And Christ prayed that we would be one so that people will get a glimpse of who he is. The importance of unity. It's, it's important that we remain one. Father, thank you for the blessed privilege to study your word, to share your word, 
to receive your word. And Lord, you are calling out your church. It's not a building. It's not a denomination. But it's a people that have been set apart. Operating under the great I am. You called us to be salt and light. Jesus prayed, I'm not taking them out of the world. But you left us here so that people will know what Jesus looks like by his church, the body of Christ. And Lord, help us value unity. Help us place a pro- high priority on unity because it is critically important, especially in the times in which we live. There's so much division, so much division in our world. May your church be one. In Jesus' name, amen.